I invite you to open your Bible with me now to the book of Philemon, if you would. And if you don't have a Bible, as usual, we do have Bibles in the pews underneath your seat there. You can reach down and grab one. I encourage you to open that with me, though, uh, everyone to open it with me as we look to God's Word as found in the book of Philemon this morning. And if you weren't with us last Sunday, we began a short sermon series. This is only going to be three weeks on the book of Philemon. And it's a short sermon series because it's a short book. (laughs) It's a total of one chapter. It's a total of 25 verses. It's Paul's shortest letter. And because of that, I said last Sunday that many people overlook this letter. It may be uh, the most overlooked letter in the New Testament. Some people don't even realize it was there. It's very easy to miss, and yet it is full of important truth that we need to be reminded of today. And so this morning, I'm going to focus my sermon on verses 8 through 16, but I'm going to begin the reading at the the beginning of the letter just so that we can remember the context from what we saw last week. Hear now the word of the Lord. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, and our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Grace to you, and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord." For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, which is true In every generation, Lord, it is just as true today as it was hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Your word is unchanging, and it is trustworthy for our lives. So help us to build our lives upon your word, to build upon the rock and not upon the sand. And may your word permeate everything that we do, everything that we say, everything that we even think, Lord. Do your work in us through this word we we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. During the 1990s, one of the events that shocked the world was the Rwandan genocide of 1994. Some of you probably remember seeing the movie Hotel Rwanda, which was partially based upon those events. On April 7th of that year, the nation of Rwanda collapsed into violence. After the assassination of the Rwandan president, the ruling Hutu tribe launched a genocide against their Tutsi neighbors, killing roughly 800,000 people, or roughly 70% of the Tutsis. And it was brought to an end when a rebel Tutsi army invaded the capital of Kigali in July of that same year. Now, as shocking as those events were, one of the most shocking facts about it is that 
90% of the population of Rwanda is professing Christians. 90% of all of those people were professing Christians. And it brings up an uncomfortable question, and that is, how could a country comprised of a population that is 90% professed Jesus followers have committed such an atrocity? Well, according to an intervarsity leader who worked in Rwanda and lived in Rwanda, he said the problem was that the missionaries there preached about having a right relationship with God, but they did not communicate the importance of having a right relationship with one another. And so he said, quote, that is why we can be 90% Christian and yet kill in the name of ethnicity. Sobering. The gospel doesn't just show us how to have a right relationship with God. It also shows us how to have right relationships with one another. Or to put it differently, the gospel does not just transform our lives, it also transforms our relationships. And that is why, as Christians, it is not just important to get our doctrine right, it's also important to get our relationships right. Because in some ways, our witness depends upon it. Our relationships, in some ways, are a test case for whether we have truly understood the gospel. And so last week, when we looked at the first part of Philemon, we talked about how the gospel transforms our lives and how we we are in, in a process of being transformed as individuals. In the second part of Philemon, what we're going to see is Paul makes an appeal to Philemon. And in this appeal, he makes clear that the gospel does not just transform our lives, but it also transforms our relationships. And that's what I want to talk about together. So let's look at this appeal that Paul makes together. And the first thing I want you to see is the posture of Paul's appeal. In verse 8, he says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. When Paul wrote this letter to Philemon, and he's going to make an appeal to him, he's going to to ask him to do something, he could have asserted his apostolic authority and commanded on the basis of his authority for Philemon to do what Paul was going to ask him to do. But he doesn't take that posture, he takes a different posture, and I want you to notice, first of all, it's a posture of humility. (coughs) Here, in these verses, and in the opening verse, Paul actually identifies himself not as an apostle of Christ, but as a prisoner for Christ. And what's interesting is if you read all of Paul's other letters, most of his letters he identifies himself as an apostle of Christ. That's how he kind of opens and introduces himself. This is the only letter where he uses the title, prisoner for Christ. And by using that title, Paul was on the one hand, showing his complete commitment to Jesus, that he's willing to be a prisoner for Jesus, to suffer for Jesus. But he's also, I think, quite deliberately downplaying his apostolic authority and making clear that it's not his apostolic authority that he's going to use to command Philemon to do something. He's taking a posture of humility, and secondly, it's a posture of love. Notice he says to Philemon, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. In other words, he's going to ask Philemon to do something, not on the basis of obligation, but on the basis of love. And and, and I want you to see this morning that those two things are very different. Love and obligation are two different things. In fact, uh, love is a much higher bar than obligation. You know, so often when we think about how do we treat others, when I think about how I should treat others, So often, I I think in terms of, well, what am I obligated to do for them? You know, what do I have to do, right? (laughs) What am I obligated to do? But, you know, that's a pretty low bar when you think about it. Um, Obligation's not a bad thing, but from a Christian perspective, we're not just to ask, what am I obligated to do for others, but how can I love others? And specifically, how can I show others the love that Christ has shown me. Notice that's a much higher bar, isn't it? Paul says these words in 2 Corinthians. He says, For the love of Christ controls us. 
Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died, and he died for all, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Christians are called to be a people who are controlled and compelled by Christ's love. That means there may be certain things that we're not obligated to do, but that we still are called and compelled to do because the love of Christ controls us and compels us. Compelled and controlled by love. So Paul appeals to Philemon from a posture of both humility and love. Now, that's the posture of his appeal. Now, notice who the person of this appeal is. Secondly, Paul says in verse 10, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. Now, who was Onesimus? Last week we talked a little bit about who Philemon was. Who's Onesimus? Well, we can tell from this letter, and he's also mentioned in Colossians, because this uh, individual, both Philemon and Onesimus, were part of that church in Colossae. So we can tell from those letters that um, Onesimus was one of Philemon's slaves. He was what we might call a bond servant. And at some point, he had run away from Philemon's household. And in the process, it appears that he also may have wronged Philemon in some way. We don't know. It's possible that he stole some money or stole some property. But after fleeing from Philemon, Onesimus went to Rome. And that's where he was living. And during his time in Rome, he met the Apostle Paul... He also seems to have become a Christian, and he began helping Paul, who was severely constrained at that time because he was himself a prisoner. And so Paul and Onesimus developed this very close relationship. Not only did Onesimus become useful to Paul, but he became a spiritual son to Paul. However, as much as Paul would have liked to retain Onesimus's services, he felt that he needed to send him back to Philemon. Paul says in verse 12, I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel, but I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. Now, understand this. Paul would have been very glad, he says, to keep Onesimus with him. Um, In fact, he probably could have justified it in his head if he wanted to. He could have said, look, uh, I need somebody by my side right now, and God has put this young man here. Uh, Look at how much good work is getting done. Look at how effective this partnership is. And he could have justified it in his head, and he could have just decided to do that and not even told Philemon about the whole situation. Remember, there's, there's, you know, no telephone calls in these days. There's no emails and so they were separated by a long distance and he could have just said well Philemon doesn't need to know what's going on but Paul knew that would not have been right because Onesimus had run away there was a relationship that had been broken that needed to be reconciled and there were wrongs that needed to be made right and Paul was not going to overlook that you know it's a reminder that faithful Christians We don't overlook wrong things in the name of doing right things. Uh, We don't justify sinful actions and sinful behaviors just in the name of achieving some kind of greater goal and saying, well, yeah, but look at how much good might come out of this or look at how much good ministry might get done. That's that's not what we do because Paul knew that would not be a, a decision of integrity. It would have been, as I said, easy for Paul to overlook this whole situation In fact, sending Onesimus back would have been extremely inconvenient for Paul at this moment. He needed help. And this young man was extremely helpful to him. And so to make this decision was extremely inconvenient for him. But but hear me when I say this. Oftentimes, as a follower of Jesus, the right decision is not always the most convenient one. Doing what is right by Christ is often very inconvenient to our lives. And Paul was ready to do the inconvenient thing because he knew it was the right thing. 
Now, I want to be clear. Paul wasn't sending Onesimus back because he wanted him to return to slavery. Talked about this a little bit last week. But Paul, in fact, as we're going to see in a moment, does not want him to return to slavery. And in fact, if you read between the lines of this letter, it sounds as if Paul really wants Philemon to uh, send Onesimus back again to Rome so that they can continue working together. However, if they're going to continue working together, Paul wants it to be under the right circumstances. He wants it to be with Philemon's blessing, and he wants this relationship to be reconciled. So that brings us to the third thing, which is the purpose of Paul's appeal. Here we get to the heart of what he was going to ask, verses 15 and 16. He says, For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Now, here's what I want you to see. Paul is making an appeal to Philemon to do something that is extremely counter-cultural. And that is, Paul is saying, I would like you to receive him back, but no longer as a slave. No longer as a bondservant, but as what? As a brother in Christ. Now, why would Paul ask this? Well, the answer is because Paul understood the gospel does not just transform our lives, it transforms our relationships. It transforms the way we relate to other people, the way we look at other people, the way we treat other people. And and when a person receives Jesus Christ, it fundamentally changes the way we relate to others around us, especially those who are followers of Jesus. You can see this if you read through Paul's letters. And he references this in some way or another in almost every letter he wrote. Galatians, he said in Galatians 3.27, For as many of of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He was telling the Galatians that all believers in Christ are children of God, which means that they are brothers and sisters now. When Paul wrote to the Colossian church, which again, remember, that's Philemon's church. That's Onesimus' I guess, church, or the one that he would have come from. He said something very similar. Listen to what he says in Colossians 3. He says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. According to Paul, when a person is in Christ, all of the, their earthly identities are no longer significant. What ethnicity you are is not significant in Christ. What nationality you are is not significant in Christ. What social status you are, slave or free in his day, was no longer a significant distinction. Why? Because when you're in Christ, you're a child of God. Now your primary identity is in Christ. And as I said a moment ago, that means every single other believer is now a brother or sister to you, spiritually speaking. I don't know if you notice this or not, but if you read through this little letter, it is full of what I'd call family language. So, in the opening of the letter, Paul calls Timothy his brother and Aphia his sister. And then later, he describes himself as a father to Onesimus and Onesimus as a son to him. And then he addresses Philemon as a brother. He appeals to Philemon to receive Onesimus as a brother. And none of these people are related by blood. And so why is he using all of this brother, sister, father, son, all of this family language? Well, the answer is because, to quote again from Colossians, in Christ there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. What Paul wanted Philemon to see is that the gospel should transform our relationships. And that means that when we're in Christ, it should change the way we look at others. There there should be a correspondence between the way Christ sees others and the way I see 
others. So previously, when Philemon looked at Onesimus, all he saw was that this was one of his servants. This was one of his slaves. And that's how he related to him. But now in the gospel, what Paul is calling him to see is that the gospel transforms that and calls him to see and relate to Onesimus in a new way. No longer as a slave, but as a brother. So last week, when we concluded, I offered three thoughts for application as we reflect on this letter. And I want to do the same thing this morning to give three kind of things to ponder for application from these verses today. And I want to phrase these in a for, each one in the form of a question for us to reflect on. Here's number one. We need to ask ourselves, are we defined by earthly identities or are we defined by our identity in Christ? What, what are we allowing to define us as individuals? What is the primary thing that identifies us and that shapes our understanding of who we are? Is it our identity in Christ or is it other things? This is a really important question to ask that comes out of Philemon. It's especially important as we're now on the other side of another election. You know, in recent years, I feel like there has been an increasing trend that I've seen, particularly in the United States, for Christians to define themselves on, based on other identities primarily rather than their identity in Christ. And so we elevate other identities that we're latching on to, whether it's a, our national identity, whether it's a political identity of a, one political party or another political party, and, and, and we, we start elevating or, or uh, obsessing over other identities and making those identities primary rather than our identity in Christ being primary. And let me just give you a warning this morning. If you allow any other identity to become more important and more primary than your identity in Christ as a Christian, it will have devastating consequences. It will have devastating consequences for you and others around you. Because number one, instead of your life reflecting Christ, your life is going to start reflecting something or someone else more than Christ. And number two, Instead of the church being united, you are going to begin to divide yourself from others in the body of Christ based upon other alternative identities. Do not allow that to happen. Our primary identity is in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. And we need to ask this question. Are we defined by earthly identities or our identity in Christ? Philemon is a reminder. We need to have our identity in Christ alone. Here's a second question for you. Are we formed by the culture or by the gospel? Remember, in Paul's day, the cultural practice of slavery was common and acceptable as a practice throughout the Roman Empire. Most people would not have given this practice a second thought. It was culturally common, it was culturally acceptable, but what Paul's letters, not just this one, but others indicate, is that our primary concern as Christians is not what's acceptable culturally, not what's widely practiced in the world around me. Again, it would have been perfectly culturally acceptable for Philemon to keep Onesimus as a slave. Nobody around him in the surrounding culture would have batted an eyelash at that, and yet, what Paul makes clear is that while this may have been culturally acceptable, it would not have been spiritually acceptable. And you know, the same thing holds true today. I don't think I need to tell you this, but there are many attitudes, many ways of thinking, many practices, many behaviors that are completely common and acceptable to our culture around us, to American culture, but that may not be acceptable according to Christ's standards. Don't forget, if you are a Christian, your primary citizenship is now in the kingdom of God, which means that you live your life not by the standards and the norms of what this world says is an acceptable way to conduct yourself. You now are accountable to kingdom standards, to living according to what it means to be a follower of Christ. And that means that what makes a good citizen in this world 
according to the world around you, is not necessarily what makes a good citizen of Christ's kingdom. Our calling is not to live lives that are worthy of this world, but that are worthy of the gospel. So, again, we have to ask ourselves daily, are we formed by the culture or by the gospel? You know, Philemon was a man who had been transformed in so many ways. As we said last week, this man was a genuine Christian. Paul wasn't doubting that. But there were ways in which his life still reflected more of the culture around him than it did the gospel. And he needed to see the ways in which he needed to reflect the gospel. We need to see the ways in which our lives might still reflect more of the culture than they do the gospel. And here's the last question for you to reflect on, and that is, are we governed by obligation or by love? Paul, when he wrote to Philemon, he, he didn't want to compel him with a command. He wanted to appeal to him from love. And another thing we need to recognize is that from a worldly perspective, Philemon was not obligated to do what Paul was asking him to do. He was not obligated to release Onesimus from slavery from a worldly perspective. In fact, that decision probably would have looked strange to many of the people in the world around him, and it would have actually come at a cost to him. But again, we consider our decisions not on the basis of obligation, but by love. And specifically, we are called to reflect the same kind of love that Jesus reflected to others. 1 John 4 says, In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. The gospel does not just transform our lives, it transforms our relationships. And those who have received God's love in the gospel are called to then be conduits of his love toward others and to allow his love to reshape, to reorient, to transform the way in which we relate to others. I'm reminded of the words of the famous hymn, which we're going to sing as we close in just a few minutes, where it says, Thou our Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other. Lift us to the joy divine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. And we don't deserve it, Lord. As we just read from your word, this is love. Not that, not that we have loved you, but that you loved us. Sent your son to be the propitiation for our sins. Lord, we thank you for loving us while we were sinners. We pray that you would help us now to love one another, to love our neighbor, to love all of those who are around us. Father, I pray for each one of us here this morning. We are all still in need of sanctification. And I pray that you would reveal to us and expose the areas of our lives where we are still conformed too much to our culture and not enough to the gospel. And I pray that you would continue to transform our lives and transform our relationships for your glory, Lord, and for your glory alone. We pray all these things